Hi, welcome back to session 10 of World Revolutions. Today we're looking at Vietnam, and in the first half of this session, we were looking at the historical background of Vietnam. And let me just go back to that slide for a moment that I was using earlier on uh, to reiterate these points about the importance of Vietnamese nationalism, this very long history of resistance to external control, the importance of the Vietnamese village in terms of its independence, uh, and the fact that most peasants were accustomed to having a significant say in what happened with their own society, at least within their villages. Then, looking at French legacies, what kinds of changes in particular did the French bring? And emphasizing especially their land policies and the effort to create this new export economy uh, in Vietnam, which they succeeded in doing, but at the cost of vast amounts of land once directly controlled by Vietnamese peasants. And now more and more of those peasants become tenants upon large agricultural estates owned by a new landowning class created essentially by the French themselves. We also have the creation of a discontented middle class, people who receive education from the French all the way through university, but then find their opportunities severely limited by the dominance of the ethnic Chinese in the international trade area, and then the French who dominate the entire bureaucratic structure of colonial rule. So we have two elements of a revolutionary alliance that are going to fuse together in this rebellion, in this revolution, during the 20th century. And both the discontented peasantry, because of loss of land, and the middle class, because of a lack of opportunity. And of course, as Vietnamese, they share this common idea about the independence of Vietnam and rejection of foreign domination, especially French colonialism. These forces will come together, although not in quite as unified and simple a fashion uh, as I might have suggested when I referred specifically to the communists and their role in all of this. Uh, the fact is that other groups as well, as we will see, will also challenge French rule, but it is the communists who most effectively draw upon these factors, the discontents of the peasants and the middle class and Vietnamese nationalism to finally create a successful revolution and oust the French from rule. Now, it is impossible to talk about the Vietnamese Revolution without talking about one person, as it is to talk about the Cuban Revolution without talking about one individual. Ho Chi Minh, which is really the nom de guerre, a name he assumed in order to uh, partly uh, disguise his identity for what it was worth at the time. Uh, Ho Chi Minh becomes that central figure. Uh, he is the individual who Vietnamese will recognize for all time as the individual who led the successful rebellion against uh, the French colonialists and who created the modern uh, Vietnamese nation, modern Vietnamese society. He is also, at the same time, uh, one of the most fascinating figures in modern history. Uh, he has uh, this unusual uh, biography uh, that recounts his development as a revolutionary. Now, he comes from circumstances that we would expect a revolutionary to come from in Vietnam in the sense that he is essentially from the middle class. Uh, his father was a provincial official. And at least that opportunity might have been available to Ho as well, but he chose early on uh, to take a different route, uh, to oppose French rule, and for a time even, uh, to leave Vietnam itself. In 1911, he would leave Vietnam and would not return for many years. Uh, he would become an international wanderer, if you will. He signs on board a, a commercial steamship uh, leaving Vietnam and then travels uh, across the Pacific, stays for a time in uh, the city of Boston, uh, here in this country, and then New York City, working part-time as a chef's helper. Uh, he's a deck mate on the ships that he sails on. He has become a global wanderer, if you will. Eventually, Ho decides to travel to England and then to France. And it may have been in England uh, that he was uh, first exposed to the ideas of Marxism. Up until now, yes, he, like most Vietnamese, is a nationalist. Uh, he resents and resists uh, the rule of the French. But this is probably where his first ideological exposure occurred uh, to the ideas of communism, the ideas of Marxism. 
However, his commitment towards leftist ideology won't really come until he goes to Paris and there becomes enmeshed in the Vietnamese exile community that exists there during this time. As you remember, I was talking in the first half about how many Vietnamese uh, actually went to Paris to gain an education, or at least a part of their education, and many of them never returned to Vietnam. Uh, they found hmm, French culture to their liking, and at the same time, as long as French colonial rule remained, the opportunities for them uh, back in their home country were extremely limited. So there are tens of thousands of Vietnamese living uh, in and around Paris, and they form an active intellectual community. And some of them uh, have strong links to the Socialist Party in France and are themselves socialists. Ho Chi Minh becomes involved with these people. He becomes an author. He begins writing uh, articles uh, for a local socialist journal uh, discussing the issues of the day and, of course, constantly going back to the issue of Vietnamese nationalism, the right of the Vietnamese people to independence. It is at this time, at least, in the years leading up to and during the First World War that Ho Chi Minh clearly moves towards socialism. He's not a communist at this point, but he accepts many of the ideas of French socialism and, of course, still remains a prominent nationalist in his own thinking. He is also influenced by the writings of Lenin, the Russian revolutionary whom we have talked about earlier. Uh, specifically, he is interested in Lenin's ideas about imperialism, colonialism, and what we now call the Third World. What is to be the fate of these societies? Lenin made it clear early on uh, in the Soviet revolutionary struggle that the Soviet Union would look towards these colonized people as important allies of the future. Clearly, as the Bolsheviks seized power in 1917 in uh, Russia, it's clear that they cannot turn to the Western powers or any of the major world powers uh, for support of their revolution. Certainly the Japanese empire isn't going to support them, nor are the Germans, uh, and certainly not the Americans or the French or the British. In fact, all three of them will try to intervene, as we saw, unsuccessfully on the side of the white armies during the Civil War. So the Soviet Union is going to be left looking for allies in the world. And one of the places that Lenin thinks he can find them are, is in those areas that have been colonized by the Europeans. The Bolsheviks take a strong anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism stance and begin to try to encourage uh, groups in these areas to act against colonial rule. They realize that the base of support that these movements can hope to find in their own societies at this time is fairly limited. After all, Lenin still believes that revolution, as in Russia, will come thanks in large part to the actions of the proletariat. You're not going to find an industrial proletariat in Vietnam. Uh, and as we saw in China, even there, uh, Mao would eventually have to turn towards the peasantry. But nevertheless, Lenin believes this would be an important first step in trying to weaken the grip of the Western powers on much of the world and to eventually create allies for uh, the Soviet Union. So as a result, there is already this receptive environment for Ho Chi Minh in terms of his thinking when he reads about Lenin's policies. Even though he, again, is not at this time a committed communist, here is the kind of policy that Ho Chi Minh has been hoping to see uh, from an emerging world power, and that is one that supports a strong anti-colonial stance. However, at this time, Ho's main hopes are not focused on Lenin and the Soviet Union. They're focused on the United States. When the Allied powers meet in Versailles at the end of World War I to decide how Europe will be redrawn in terms of its borders and to try to create a new peace for the future, Ho Chi Minh will approach, or try to approach, he never actually succeeds in meeting, uh, the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson had issued his famous 14 points, talking about what kind of future world order he believes should be created. And one of the major points was the right of self-determination. In other words, the right of people to essentially establish their own country, have their own nation. 
However, what Wilson was thinking about was not Western colonies like Vietnam. He was thinking about societies in Eastern Europe, places that had been overrun by the great powers over the years and carved and recarved. Poland, of course, had been one of those victims, but uh, much of the Balkans, etc., had been a uh, victim of similar kinds of subjugation. And what Wilson was talking about was the right of people in those areas uh, to break up uh, collections such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire and redraw the map of Europe into new independent nations. He was thinking of Eastern Europe and the Balkans. But Ho Chi Minh wants to appeal to him on the grounds that so too the Vietnamese people have a right to self-determination and you should certainly support it. Of course, Ho was never going to get near uh, President Wilson. Uh, the most he would get to do was visit with a, a group, of, a delegation of Vietnamese and French socialists and talk to the French president about uh, the needs for self-determination. But this is an attempt to appeal to Wilson illustrates some pragmatic thinking on the part of Ho Chi Minh even at this early stage. And it is this. When he looks around the globe at world powers and he knows that by itself Vietnam is going to have a hard time overthrowing French rule, if he is looking for potential allies, where might he find them among the world's powers at this time? Well, there's only one that is not a significant colonial power, only one that doesn't have a vast array of colonies, and that's the United States, as the United States has taken control of the Philippines and it's uh, taken control of Puerto Rico as a result of uh, the war with Spain, in which we also temporarily took control of Cuba, but still the United States is not a major colonial power. And the United States had long opposed imperialism, at least the European version of imperialism, because it excluded Americans from trade with Western colonies. So here is the one world power that in Ho's mind is likely to be sympathetic to the idea of decolonization, of an end of French rule in places like Vietnam. So his appeal to Wilson is a very pragmatic one. It isn't uh, simply a bit of idealism that he reads the 14 points and thinks, oh, well, this is just the man for me. He's thinking in the long term that, look, at the Americans, if there is any ally out there among the world's powers that I can turn to, it's probably the United States. And the United States was rapidly emerging as the leading world power economically and militarily. So here's the perfect opportunity to appeal to them, a country without a long history of possession of numerous colonies and a country that was generally opposed to the idea of European colonialism, largely out of pragmatic uh, considerations that it cut off trade for the United States. This is not the last time that Ho Chi Minh will try to appeal to the United States in the hopes of winning them over as an ally and trying to make them an ally in the Vietnamese revolutionary process. However, that was not to be. He would never get to see President Wilson and he would eventually go on and visit the Soviet Union, uh, partly out of curiosity, partly out of uh, a belief that Lenin was certainly talking uh, the kinds of things, the kinds of policies that would be supportive of a Vietnamese move for independence uh, with his concern for uh, establishing movements in the third world to throw off imperial control. He is also fascinated by what he sees in the Soviet Union in terms of this vast social and economic experiment. Now here is Karl Marx, at least in some version, being implemented uh, as the state took over control of the economy, it attempted to create a more equitable society, redistributed wealth of various kinds, and at the same time was pushing forward with one of the goals of all Vietnamese nationalists, and that was economic development. So the Soviet Union has a variety of fascinations for Ho Chi Minh. Lenin has an anti-colonial policy. This is a vast social and economic revolution underway. And here is a society which was, by all standards of the West at this time, underdeveloped, trying to modernize and industrialize in rapid order. All of these things would attract Ho Chi Minh and eventually draw him in to becoming a communist himself. And it is during his time, his stay in the Soviet Union that he commits uh, to becoming a member uh, of uh, the communist international, the communist international movement. And it is Ho who will help establish the Communist Party uh, in Vietnam, as we will see in a few minutes.
but it's important to understand uh, Ho Chi Minh's views uh, because they were not entirely orthodox, um, at least in the views of many, such as Joseph Stalin. Uh, Stalin would remain throughout his own period of rule in the Soviet Union uh, suspicious of Ho Chi Minh because he felt Ho put far too much emphasis and focus, one, on nationalism, and two, on being a pragmatist in terms of how much could one hope to accomplish uh, in this revolutionary movement. Uh, and it often seemed to Stalin that uh, Ho Chi Minh was far more interested in establishing an independent nation uh, than in creating an ideal communist state. Uh, and indeed, uh, Ho Chi Minh will remain throughout his life and his activities a pragmatist uh, whose first order of business was to end French rule and end foreign domination in Vietnam, and then secondarily uh, to create a more equitable society and create a society somewhat along the lines that Karl Marx had envisioned. Now, in order to function effectively in trying to organize in Vietnam uh, a movement to oppose uh, French rule, Ho Chi Minh was going to have to spend a great deal of time in southern China. This is the area that borders Vietnam. This is a place where a variety of Vietnamese revolutionaries, and there were a number of them by the 1920s, uh, will turn to as a place of refuge. This is a place where they can try to organize, try to build up potential military forces, uh, and it is a place where they will enjoy a fair degree of sympathy, at least for a time, from uh, the Chinese nationalists, from the Kuomintang. And remember, this is the period in the early 1920s when the Kuomintang and the newly created Chinese Communist Party are still cooperating with each other, so it's not as if they're selling themselves out. And at the same time, uh, this is a time when China is not in a position to really dominate Vietnam in any way, so and the idea that China represents an immediate threat is certainly not true. There are still suspicions uh, on the part of the Vietnamese. They are always uh, leery of uh, too much cooperation with the Chinese, but nevertheless it is at this time uh, that Ho Chi Minh will travel to southern China uh, as a base from which he can operate in trying to create an effective revolutionary force in Vietnam and avoid French uh, control and French attempts to arrest him. During his time in southern China, uh, he will meet with and talk with Fan Boi Chao and discuss their common interests. Uh, it wasn't exactly a first meeting because Ho Chi Minh was Win Tat Than. He was the son of that provincial administrator that Fan Boi Chao had met with when he was developing the modernization society. It was that young man who had become Ho Chi Minh. And now, Fan Boi Chao will agree to serve as at least one of the titular heads, one of the, almost a figurehead, if you will, uh, of the movement that Ho Chi Minh is trying to organize in Vietnam. And it's understandable why they would have common interests. Fan Boi Chao is not a communist, there's no orientation that in that direction. But when you think about them, here are two men, two different generations, Fan Boi Chao, the, if you want, one of the last of the mandarins, and Ho Chi Minh, one of the first of the modern-day revolutionaries, the Marxist. Uh, and yet, what do they both want? They both want an end to colonialism, an end to French domination, and they want to create a modern society in Vietnam. A great deal that holds them in common. So we see this tradition, in, in essence, passing on or evolving in Vietnam uh, among these nationalists, moving from Phan Boi Chao to Ho Chi Minh, uh, two of the first modern nationalists uh, in uh, Vietnamese history. Their alliance will be short-lived, however, because Phan Boi Chao will uh, soon be arrested and sent back and subjected to long-term imprisonment in Vietnam. Uh, his case is an illustration of the dangers of challenging French rule. This was not just a matter of, well, gee, we have some dissidents here and uh, they're causing us a problem. Uh, the fact is, uh, overt resistance and calling for the end of French rule uh, could lead to long prison terms, if not execution, uh, under the French colonial system. And Phan Boi Chao would suffer that exact fate. He would spend uh, really the rest of his life once he was arrested uh, in a French prison and would die in the 1940s. 
uh, never to see the uh, triumph of the uh, revolutionary forces in Vietnam. But we do see this sort of uh, generational transition from Phan Boi Chau, uh, the Mandarin nationalist, to Ho Chi Minh, the Marxist nationalist. Now, as I said earlier, uh, to su suggest that it is simply the communists uh, who eventually emerge and dominate uh, the revolutionary uh, process, uh, to suggest that they are the only ones involved in this effort uh, is simply untrue because there are a series of efforts uh, even before the Communist Party is officially organized, as we will see, uh, that try to lead Vietnam out of domination by the French. One of these uh, movements is what is known as the Constitutionalist Party. The Constitutionalist Party is by far the most conservative of the three that we're going to talk about. Uh, and it's fairly easy to see why they would be uh, conservative, because they consist primarily uh, of members of the new landowning class, uh, the people who have prospered uh, under French rule, people whose very existence as large commercial landowners was brought into existence uh, by the French. I mean, they owe their very existence to the French. The French were the ones that passed the laws that allowed them to acquire peasant lands. So the Constitutionalist Party, by its very name, doesn't suggest anything terribly revolutionary. And indeed, their agenda has more to do with trying to get the French to accept greater participation by the Vietnamese themselves in the colonial administration. They're not really pushing for uh, outright independence at this time. Uh, they believe that indeed the French do have a civilizing mission that they are performing, that they are helping to modernize uh, Vietnamese society. But in that process, the Vietnamese should be allowed to play a larger role to have greater participation in the administration uh, of Vietnam as technically a protectorate uh, of the French regime. That kind of mentality and, of course, the economic origins of this group indicates why ultimately they would have minimal impact. This is not a group that's going to go out and try to rally the peasants and the middle class to oust the French. That's the last thing in the world they want. And this is a group that would be in deadly fear of any type of violent upheaval that it would involve the peasants because, of course, if the peasants are out to get the French because they deprive them of their land, they're obviously also going to go after the people who actually took that land, which to a considerable degree would consist of members of the Constitutionalist Party. Uh, this is a group that is not uncommon uh, in the history of colonial possessions in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Uh, we see these movements that develop that are very conservative, relatively speaking. They're well-to-do members of colonial society who resent that indeed they are so totally excluded from any type of self-governance, want some change in that process, but on the other hand, do not want to risk the status quo in a violent revolution, which might well turn against them as well as the colonial powers. So the constitutionalists are there, they're calling for reform, for more participation, but they're not exactly a revolutionary force, and they don't really seek uh, broad uh, participation by the population in their efforts at reform. The second group, on the other hand, the nationalists, uh, is far more vehement in their insistence on self-rule for Vietnam and quite willing to take up arms if necessary to achieve that. This group draws its support particularly from the middle class. These are people who are government bureaucrats, some, some young military officers because of course the colonial army consists not only of French troops but to a considerable degree Vietnamese. Uh, they're professional people, lawyers, doctors, uh, who want to see an end to French rule, who want to see an independent uh, Vietnam. They would very much be you know, comfortable with Phan Boi Chau and many of his ideas, uh, but they are unwilling at the same time to rally mass-based support. You know, they have their own elitist mentality about all of this, that yes, they want an end to French rule, but they are not willing uh, to risk a mass uprising. They too see themselves as having a certain stake in society as it is, in the sense that a true revolutionary upheaval that calls for you know, the arming of the peasantry, etc., uh, 
again, that risks outright social and economic revolution that would jeopardize the interests that these people have. They want independence, but they do not want a mass uprising. Instead, what they will attempt in 1930 is essentially a military coup. They will try to use uh, the officers in the colonial military, who are members of the party, to try to oust the French. And their effort will quickly collapse. Uh, this actually a fairly weak effort at a military coup. Like the Mandarins of the late 19th century, they too once again prove that if the French were to be dislodged, it had to be done by something more than a small elite group. It would take some type of mass-based party and a mass uh, revolutionary uprising in order to end French rule. Meanwhile, Ho Chi Minh has been busy organizing and his first institution uh, is what's called the Revolutionary Youth League, created in 1925. And it's the Revolutionary Youth League that eventually becomes the uh, Communist Party of Vietnam. Through time, however, we'll see, just as with the creation of the Revolutionary Youth League, uh, Ho Chi Minh is always concerned about not appearing uh, to focus only on the Communist Party and the Communist Party as the exclusive agent of independence. He is constantly trying to build bridges uh, to other groups, more moderate groups, uh, to support his efforts, recognizing that if indeed the Communists are isolated as radicals, that they can never hope to achieve independence uh, for Vietnam. So he's quite willing to compromise. Again, one of the reasons why Stalin would be suspicious of him. Uh, remember, the communists, the Bolsheviks in Russia, their idea was that you formed this small elite cadre hmm, to lead the revolution. Ho Chi Minh, yes, we have the Communist Party, but we feel the Communist Party needs to be reaching out to other groups, even if most of them, the vast majority, are not communists or Marxist in any orientation because we need their support, we need to build these broader-based institutions. And he will do that time and again. The Communist League is an example of that, and we'll come back to several others. It is the Communist Party uh, which, however, does form the core of his support and his ability uh, to influence events in Vietnam at this time. However, the Communists are going to find themselves, even in their formative stages, remember they've only been around for four years really, uh, by 1929, they're going to find themselves in their formative stages uh, with a life or death decision to make. Vietnam's economy has been suffering excruciating dislocations because of the decline in world prices for basic foodstuffs, including rice. Basic raw materials, agricultural products in the late 1920s were dropping in price and as a result creating a crisis within Vietnamese agriculture and within the Vietnamese economy. Uh, there simply was no way to make a profit on the export of rice in these years at the end of the 1920s because of the dramatic drop. And Vietnam had become dependent upon those exports. It had gone from exporting a few, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 uh, tons of rice a year to millions of tons of rice and was heavily dependent upon those revenues. Now the price of the product is slipping and sliding uh, to the point where a profit can no longer be made. As a result, uh, merchants and landowners are trying to uh, hoard rice, store it to try to force up the price. At the same time, uh, they are reducing their tenants and the pe peasantry in general uh, to a level below subsistence at times in terms of what they are paid, what they receive for their labors. So there is this dual exploitation going on as the income of people in the countryside drops and at the same time scarcities are created in the very product that they are producing in, a, in an attempt to raise the prices of rice. Those conditions create finally a massive explosion in the Vietnamese countryside, particularly in the northern half of Vietnam, where, again, peasant villages have survived more intact than in the south and are more able to organize themselves coherently. A rebellion breaks out 
with peasants attacking landowners, executing them, seizing their land, attacking merchants, breaking into grain storage facilities. The communists are not behind this. In fact, the communists from the outset fear that this is the type of uh, spontaneous rebellion that will be easily defeated by the French. Their problem is that if they stand back and do nothing, then their reputation among people in the countryside will be destroyed. Where were you when the revolution started? You revolutionaries. On the other hand, if they choose to throw their backing to the peasants and even take leadership positions, they feel certain that this rebellion is going to be crushed and they along with it. Finally, the decision is made to throw their support to the peasants. And the outcome is as inevitable as Ho Chi Minh suspected, and that is the French use their military might to crush the rebellion. They arrest thousands of communist uh, cadre, in other words, the hardcore members of the party. Uh, thousands are executed. Others are thrown into prison for long sentences. Uh, the party is effectively smashed and is forced to go underground and operate um, in a clandestine manner in the years ahead. As we will see, that serves a certain benefit to the communists because they are better equipped as a result of having to operate uh, as a covert force uh, than are their competitors, particularly the nationalists. They are the ones who learn to live outside the law, to operate in small cells uh, in the years ahead as the French ban the party and try to consistently arrest its members. As for Ho Chi Minh, uh, he is forced into exile. He escapes the country and will spend, again, an extended period of his life uh, wandering uh, from one place to another, uh, usually being hotly pursued by the French or the British intelligence services, which cooperated because they saw common enemies and uh, communist nationalists like Ho Chi Minh. In fact, at one point, Ho Chi Minh was uh, arrested by the British and thrown into prison uh, that overlooked Hong Kong Harbor. Uh, he managed to fake his own death, uh, get into a bag, a body bag, that was thrown over the side of the prison into Hong Kong Harbor. He cut himself out of the bag and swam to safety and for several years enjoyed the protection of the fact that the British and the French both believed him to be dead. During this time, uh, Ho is attracted for a while to uh, the Japanese because the Japanese have become major advocates of uh, Asian nationalism, asserting that they are going to help to bring to an end Western imperialism in Asia. But over time, uh, he is unwilling to trust the Japanese because he sees them as imperialists much as uh, the French are. Uh, he again uh, works in China for a while but his suspicions of course of the Chinese are growing uh, particularly after the Kuomintang has turned upon the Chinese communists but even later his relationships with the Chinese communists will always be somewhat uneasy. Uh, this long-standing traditional concern about what is China's real desire and emphasis uh, in Vietnam? Does it really want uh, to assist the Vietnamese communists in taking power, or is it really more interested in seeing that Vietnam remains a weak and dominated state, whether by the French or later by potentially by the Chinese? And indeed, that has long been Chinese uh, foreign policy, whether under the communists, the Kuomintang, or under the empress, and that was that China had to try to avoid uh, having strong neighbors develop on her borders, that she has this vast territory, she'd been subject to invasions, as we saw when we talked about the Chinese Revolution. So Chinese governments down through the centuries have always tried to maintain a position which would allow them to create or see the creation of relatively weak states, particularly in a place like Southeast Asia. That is the reality that will come to the fore time and again in the relationship between the Chinese and the Vietnamese, even as both states move towards creating communist governments. And we'll see that process emerge, particularly in the 1950s. With the suppression of the 1929 uprising, Ho Chi Minh and the communists must turn 
once again towards fashioning a system that can function uh, clandestinely and will develop a military capacity. Ho's ally in that latter effort is this man, Vo Win Jiap, known later simply as General Jiap. He was not a military man by training. He, in fact, was, again, a product uh, of the French university system, in this case, the French university system in Vietnam. But he was an ardent nationalist, and his antipathy for the French would increase when his wife was arrested and later died in a French prison. It is he who will build the military force uh, that will support the, China, the Vietnamese communist effort to overthrow French rule. That effort will receive a tremendous boost by events in Asia in these years, specifically the outbreak of World War II, and specifically the Japanese occupation of Vietnam. The Japanese, during the war, are busy sweeping through the British and French colonial possessions in Asia. And among those that they occupy in 1940, 41, 42, are the French colonies of Southeast Asia, and specifically Vietnam. Now, the Japanese, like empire builders everywhere, do not simply try to come in and rule this entire province, this entire nation, if you will, uh, by themselves. They turn to some of the same French bureaucrats who have been ruling it for decades. Uh, many of the French bureaucrats were quite willing to go along with the Japanese. It was a good way to stay alive. Uh, and so, in some ways, although the U.S. is direct Japanese rule, much of the administrative work is done by the French colonial administrators who still remain in Vietnam. And this gives the communists really uh, a dual focus for their opposition, both against the Japanese for occupying Vietnam and for the French who aren't even you know, loyal to their own government in the end, in the end their own empire. Uh, they turn towards cooperation with the Japanese. And the communists are able to assert themselves as a leading opposition force to Japanese occupation. Now, their ability to actually oust the Japanese, that never existed. There was never any possibility that the communists were going to able, be able to, by force of arms, force the Japanese out of Vietnam. But they tremendously enhanced their reputation as revolutionary nationalists by their military strikes against the Japanese during the occupation. It is also at this time that they create what is known as the Viet Minh. What it technically translates into is the Vietnamese Independence League. This is often identified simply as, oh, this is the, the Vietnamese communists. But in fact, it was again a situation, just as with the Revolutionary Youth League, of reaching out to other opposition groups, other groups in society, and creating a broad alliance. The communists intended to dominate this and control it, but nevertheless, they realized that they needed allies from other groups in society, building up support, for example, from various ethnic groups within Vietnam, tribal groups. Uh, who had become important supporters of the communists. So this, again, demonstrates Ho Chi Minh's strategy of reaching out to groups beyond the communists themselves into the larger society to build a broad-based alliance, because his greatest concern is not necessarily a communist revolution per se, but first, the defeat of the French and the creation of an independent Vietnam. In 1945, the Japanese are finally forced to evacuate Vietnam with the collapse of their own war effort, the collapse of their own empire. It's at this time that Ho Chi Minh will rush to Hanoi, the capital in the north. If we go back to this map for a second, you can see this. Here in Hanoi, which was the capital, the colonial capital, is where Ho Chi Minh and the communists will enter in August of 1945. And it is at that time that they will declare the independence of Vietnam. 
They are taking advantage of the situation in which the Japanese have fled, the French are trying to retake control, meanwhile the British are involved, there are Chinese nationalist troops who have been brought into Vietnam. There is, in general, a chaotic situation. And the communists hope to take advantage of this, beat everyone else to the punch, declare an independent Vietnam, and then Ho Chi Minh hopes that there will be sufficient opposition to the reimposition of French colonial rule that this effort will survive. How he hopes to gain that support is made clear in part by his statement, his declaration of independence in August of 1945, which he reads from the balcony of the uh, city hall in Hanoi. The declaration of independence that he reads includes direct excerpts from the United States Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson. Ho Chi Minh is making a direct appeal once again uh, to the United States as what he believes it to be, and that is the leading world power without a vested interest in colonialism and imperialism. And indeed, Ho Chi Minh had actually received support from the United States during his war against the Japanese because the Viet Minh had helped rescue downed American flyers uh, after they had been shot down over China. Uh, so the U.S. had actually sent in advisors to help train and equip uh, some of the Viet Minh forces. However, his belief that the Americans will somehow oppose French colonial rule is simply mistaken. Uh, the American decision in the end is simply that their greatest concern now is the post-war situation in Europe, and specifically the rise of the Soviet Union seen as a direct threat to Western Europe, which lies in ruins after the war, and the United States is more than willing to concede to the British and the French their right to retain or retake their colonies as a way of rebuilding their economies and thus maintaining stability in Europe. So that strategic decision means that the United States will turn a deaf ear to Ho Chi Minh and his appeals uh, about the commonality of their experiences of two colonized people, the Americans and the Vietnamese, fighting for independence. Ho Chi Minh's options, once the Americans have made clear the fact that they don't intend to support him, are fairly limited. He will finally agree to allow French forces to re-enter uh, the northern part of Vietnam where his forces are most influential. What he extracts from the French is a very vague promise about the future development of Vietnam, uh, an eventual day of uh, a fully independent Vietnam, uh, but nothing specific. It is clear that the French intend to come back and pretty much uh, have business as usual uh, to restore their colonial possession uh, to its status prior to World War II. But there was little that Ho could do at this time because it was clear that his military forces uh, were completely outgunned by the French uh, and therefore some type of compromise had to be reached rather than having to confront an all-out French invasion. However, soon after the French return, fighting breaks out between uh, the communists and the French and it launches a long and bloody guerrilla war uh, that stretches from 1946 to 1954. Again, the struggle is particularly focused in the north at this time, in part for the reason that I mentioned earlier, and that is it is easier for the communists. There are significant communist forces in the south, too, but they are able to organize more effectively in the north because that's where villages have survived most effectively. And after 1950, with the success of the communist revolution in China, it will also be along this border area that the uh, Vietnamese communists can most easily uh, gain access to military supplies from China itself. So it is up here along the border area, here in the north, that much of the fighting will take place in this struggle from 1946 until 1954. Again, I'm not dismissing the south, but more of it is going on up here, and it is easier for the communists to organize and gain supplies in the north than they can in the south. As the war evolves, uh, the French attempt to meet the enemy everywhere in the countryside. In other words, they 
abandon a strategy of simply trying to hold the large cities like Hanoi and Haiphong, etc., and go into the countryside to confront uh, the Vietnamese communists, the Viet Minh, time and again. And it is there that, in fact, they uh, will constantly uh, face defeat because of the guerrilla war strategy of the communists. Uh, their strategy is to, for example, attack an outpost that the French established in the countryside, wait for a French relief column to come, and when the relief column comes, they ambush the relief column. So they engage in a strategy of attacking isolated units of French troops and defeating them one at a time. It is a long and bloody struggle. Then the French hit upon a new strategy. They decide that what they are going to do is establish a new powerful base in the midst of the northern Vietnamese countryside at a place called Dien Bien Phu, up in this general area here. Okay? This is where they hope to establish a powerful base that they can use to strike out at the communists in the countryside. And they believe that this base will largely be impregnable because it's surrounded by high mountains and because they can use air power, if necessary, to defend the base. Both of those beliefs prove to be catastrophically wrong. The communists are able to drag artillery up into the mountains and shell the base at Dien Bien Phu. Bad weather prevents the French from resupplying the base and from attacking effectively uh, the communist forces because of bad weather. Eventually, the French are faced with a situation in which they face outright defeat at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, they may have to surrender. But as that prospect looms, there are international negotiations going on in Geneva, Switzerland, among the great powers, along with uh, representatives of the Vietnamese communists, to resolve the situation. In those negotiations, a strange turn of events occurs. Well, the communists are insisting that all of Vietnam be turned over to them because they have already achieved victory or imminent victory on the battlefield. The French, backed by the Americans, although the French aren't too anxious to push this, but the Americans are, uh, the West in general is insisting that there be no surrender to the communists. So we have this negotiation which has two extreme possibilities. One, communists take over completely, or somehow or other the war will go on again. In the midst of this, the representative of the Chinese communists, a man named Chou Enlai, who was their foreign minister, it is the Chinese communists who recommend a compromise. And that is to divide Vietnam into north and south, temporarily, of course. Then there'll be a national election eventually, and the country will be reunited. But for the time being, to get over this impasse, divide it at the 17th parallel. Ho Chi Minh feels totally betrayed by the Chinese communists. The Chinese communists tell him, well, you know, this is just a stage in the struggle. And once this phase is over and the partition occurs, then you can go on and fight a new phase to reunify the country. As Ho Chi Minh said, the Chinese were ready to fight to the last Vietnamese. Uh, what has happened is that the Chinese are following, again, a traditional policy. They do not want a strong unified Vietnam on their border. This is a way of avoiding that. And of course, it's met with support by other members of this international conference because they see it as a way out of uh, this conflict, this dispute over how to settle the war. So Vietnam winds up divided between North and South, with communist cadres from the South being repatriated to the North. But it is a divided nation. Now, in the North, after the peace agreement, the communists go about with a reform program, dividing up land, and in fact, encouraging poorer peasants to uh, 
challenge the wealth of well-to-do peasants in the countryside, class warfare, if you will, between the wealthy and the poor peasantry. So there is a massive reshaping of land holdings in the north. But that, in turn, leads to a rebellion against the communists. This land reform process occurs at such a pace and with such little prior planning that in many cases, peasants with little claim to land receive significant land in the countryside. In other words, within the peasant community, there are always people who have only a minimal claim to land. And yet that kind of relationship was ignored by the communists, leading to this subsequent rebellion. However, again, Ho Chi Minh the pragmatist decides that what they will do is that they will redraw the lines of agrarian reform. They will go back to traditional village relationships. They will, despite the fact of creating uh, state farms, also allow peasants to hold some land for their own private use. It will be a semi-socialist reform. So he is not going to follow uh, the course of uh, Stalin, for example, in creating uh, these uh, state systems, this collectivized uh, state land. Instead, there will be a mix of land holdings. Uh, to satisfy peasant needs and peasant interests. So the North manages to stabilize largely by being pragmatic about the kinds of reform and change that it's being, bringing about. In the South, the situation is far more volatile. There is no clear chain of succession in the South. There is still the puppet emperor left over from French rule, but he is less than desirous of even returning to Vietnam. He's been living in the French Riviera. Uh, he will come back, but only under considerable pressure. Meanwhile, there are other groups contending for power, including uh, religious sects, such as the two I mentioned here, Cao Dai and Ho Wa. These are uh, religious cults that have developed in the 1920s and 30s in Vietnam, uh, and, but they also have not only religious interests, but they also have a militia function. Many of their followers are armed, and they have been involved on both sides of the struggle with the French, uh, and they now believe that with several million followers each, they can assert their control in the South. However, the Americans have a role to play in all of this, and the United States has committed itself to the survival of a non-communist government in South Vietnam. And the individual whom they choose to lead that government is this man, Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem was the leading nationalist figure in Vietnam in the early 1950s, and an ardent opponent of Ho Chi Minh and the communists. In fact, at one point, Diem was captured by the communists and interviewed by Ho Chi Minh, who tried to convince him to join the communist struggle in the larger League of Independence, the Viet Minh. But Diem refused, and Ho actually allowed him to leave with his life. However, Diem had gotten the message that his life might well be forfeit if he continued in this struggle, and he left Vietnam at this time uh, before the triumph of the Viet Minh over the French and went to live in the United States, where he had been living for several years before he was uh, summoned by uh, the United States government back to the South to lead a new government. Besides his nationalist credentials, the other distinctive feature of Diem is that he is a Catholic. On the one hand, this gives him a strong base of support among Catholics, but since they only constitute 10 percent of the population, it's not that big a base of support. This will be an ongoing difficulty for Diem. Another difficulty is that Diem was not there for the final struggle against the French. It is Ho Chi Minh who is seen as the great nationalist, the hero who defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu. A third problem for Diem is that he is not a populist in any real sense. He has no real desire to reach out and build a popular base of support uh, in the South in order to support his regime. In fact, uh, his regime is marked by a series of authoritarian measures to try to maintain its control. Village elections are canceled. Elections that are held are manipulated. The 
national election that was to take place to unify, reunify the North and the South is canceled. It will never take place. Why? Because it was too obvious that Ho Chi Minh would win that election at this time. Meanwhile, by 1959, tens of thousands of Vietnamese in the South have been arrested and imprisoned. Uh, some of them for subversive acts against the regime, but many of them simply because they are critics of the regime in the South. So Diem's efforts to build a stable regime in the South come to rely more and more on authoritarian measures rather than on building a popular democratic base of support. Another problem for Diem is that his main source of support other than the Catholics, is among the landowning classes. And therefore, even when he attempts to carry out some degree of land reform in the South, it is minimal compared to what the Communists had done in the North and compared to what the Communists had even done in the South during the fight against the French. So he is unable to create a strong base of support among the Vietnamese peasants in the South who again see this as a regime that is failing to meet their most basic need, which is for land. The communists, meanwhile, had withdrawn most of their cadres, most of their uh, hardcore members from the South as a part of the peace agreement. There are about 50,000 of them in the South. At the time of the Geneva Agreement, uh, about 40,000 were withdrawn to the North. Now, that leaves about 10,000 in the South. Their plan in terms of dealing with this situation where the national election has been canceled, how do they now reunify their country, is to once again try to reach out to the larger population to build a base of support. Specifically, they create in 1958 the National Liberation Front. And this, of course, if you think about it, the Vietnamese Independence League, we talked about the Viet Minh, the basis of communist support in the 1950s in organizing against the French. Here now in the South, against the government of South Vietnam, they organize a somewhat similar kind of operation with the National Liberation Front. This will have all kinds of political groups and social groups involved in it, you know, uh, student organizations, professional organizations, with the idea that the communists are at the core of it, but that they are reaching out to all of these other elements of society. However, Despite that similarity in strategy, relationships between the communists in the South and in the North are not entirely smooth because the Diem government is doing everything it can to suppress uh, communists and their effort to organize. It is arresting, shooting communists. And meanwhile, the government in the North is insisting that the people in the South not take up arms against the Diem regime. They want a strategy of organizing, expanding support within the South. And Ho, for a while, believes that there still will be a national election that will reunify North and South under his leadership. It's only in 1960, finally, that the North gives its blessing to the use of force by the communists in the South. Even then, the strategy is to use armed force to keep the government off the backs of the communist organizers. The idea is to keep the government off balance and allow the communists to organize and continue to expand their base of support in the South. Uh, this is still not a strategy that looks towards uh, the successful military overthrow of the government, but rather a political strategy uh, to try to get rid of uh, the South Vietnamese government. The FLN is highly successful in creating a series of functional organizations, meaning uh, these uh, groups, village peasant organizations, professional associations, etc., uh, student associations that back the general idea of national liberation, meaning an end to the government in the South and reunification with the North. The use of force, the use of terror to support this effort is again considered a strategy, but not the main strategy. The main strategy is still to build political support. On 
the side of the South, the effort of the South Vietnamese government is to try to deal with this as a military rather than a political problem. Uh, the creation of what were known as agri-villages and then strategic hamlets. These strategies were designed to take peasants out of contact with the communists in the countryside. Specifically with the strategic hamlets, uh, a series of small villages would be consolidated into one single village. Its members would be interrogated to try to eliminate communist sympathizers and then uh, these people would be part of building uh, walls around this village, setting up local guards to protect the villagers and to prevent communists from penetrating the village at night. The problem with the strategy was that it further antagonized people in the countryside. Remember, there is this powerful attachment to one's own village, ruled by the uh, village elders, the communal spirits, the place of one's ancestors, and now these people are being uprooted and thrown into villages about which they know nothing and with which they have little if any empathy uh, and traditional contact. So this strategy to isolate the communists further antagonizes the peasant population. As the efforts of the Vietnamese government in the South to survive disintegrate, uh, the United States throws ever increasing amounts of support to the regime in the South. From the time that Diem first returns to the South in the mid-1950s, the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, U.S. aid agencies, and a flow of U.S. military supplies uh, was directed into South Vietnam to try to help this government. However, as the situation became increasingly unstable in the mid-1960s, the United States finally committed itself to all-out uh, military solution to the problems of South Vietnam. Specifically in 1965, the United States committed U.S. combat troops uh, to South Vietnam with the landing of a contingent of Marines in March of 1965. Very rapidly, over the next four years, the U.S. presence in Vietnam would accelerate to the point where more than 450,000 troops were in the South by 1959. I mean 1969. The solution here again is to be a conventional military solution. What the United States sees here is a problem of guerrilla warfare challenging the South Vietnamese government and its strategy is to send in massive number of troops, engage the communist guerrillas wherever they can kill as many of them as they can with artillery and air power and eventually reduce their numbers to the point where the communist insurgency will collapse. There are two problems with this strategy. First, the North Vietnamese government will infiltrate supplies and eventually troops into the South to help compensate for the American forces. And secondly, and more importantly, this strategy overlooked the fact that the main reason for the success of the communists in the South was not their military prowess, but the fact that they enjoyed and had built such a vast network of support uh, within the South itself. It allowed them to uh, resupply many of their own losses. It allowed them to gather intelligence uh, against the government. In fact, the government itself was riddled uh, with communist spies. And so this was uh, more of a problem of the political power of the communists rather than of their military capacity. However, the United States had chosen to try to fight uh, the battle on military grounds rather than on the grounds of winning over the population. And of course, the other problem uh, had to do with the fact that the South Vietnamese government had never been able to win a mass base of support among its own people, particularly among the peasants. And it is precisely the peasantry in particular and to a considerable degree the middle class uh, who provide the base of support either as direct members of the Communist Party or as people who join the affiliated groups, these functional organizations, within the National Liberation Front. And this is the problem that uh, is at the heart of what is going on in the South Vietnam. South Vietnam is in fact the second stage of 
uh, the Vietnamese Revolution, the first stage ending with Dien Bien Phu and the signing of the Geneva Peace Agreement, and that second stage now unfolding. Many of the same issues are at stake in the South in the 1960s as were at stake throughout Vietnam in the 1950s, and that is the rights of peasants to land, the frustration of the uh, middle class at lack of opportunity, and of course the continuing issue of Vietnamese nationalism. Because the more the United States throws support uh, to the South, the more its presence becomes obvious, the more that the communist argument makes sense that what the South Vietnamese government really is is simply a puppet regime supported the, by the United States. That what they're fighting for is their national independence. So these same issues of social justice and Vietnamese nationalism are reasserting themselves ever more forcefully in the South in the struggle in the 1960s. The U.S. forces will use a variety of strategies besides overt uh, military attacks, conventional military conflict. Among them is what is known as Operation Phoenix. Uh, it is a strategy of assassinating uh, communist political leaders in the countryside as a way of undermining the infrastructure of the communist movement. Uh, the communists had assassinated government officials and now the United States encourages a policy of assassinating communist officials in the hopes of breaking the back of the communist movement by eliminating its leadership. And thousands of members of the communist cadres of the communist leadership structure uh, are killed in this effort. Uh, but again, it cannot stem the tide of battle which is turning ever more against the government in the South and the American forces. One of the most striking events is the Tet Offensive, which occurs in the beginning of 1968 when the communists make an attempt uh, to seize uh, many of the major cities and strategic objectives in the South. They are finally beaten off uh, after several months of violent conflict in some of the major areas of Vietnam, such as the city of Hue. But the Tet Offensive, despite the defeat of the communist plan to try to trigger an outright rebellion and overthrow the government at this stage, despite the fact that they far, fall, fall far short of that effort, nevertheless, uh, the American public becomes convinced that this war effort is no longer a viable solution in Vietnam, and it undermines the ability of the U.S. government to prolong the struggle into the years ahead and increasingly it will become the strategy of uh, the U.S. administration to try to find a way out of Vietnam uh, rather than suffering additional losses. What the United States is aware of, uh, even before the Tet Offensive, is the fact that indeed their ally in the South, uh, this government in South Vietnam, is riddled uh, with spies, and at the same time that popular support for the regime is dwindling even as the years pass, uh, that this is a regime that is ever more weakened by support for the communists, and even when it's not support for the communists, but by a lack of support for the regime in the South. The communists themselves, on the other hand, are able to secure uh, wave after wave of supporters to join the struggle, whether on the military or the political front, in large part drawn from supporters within the South, but when necessary, also drawn from uh, sources from the North, as the Communist government of the North provides support to its uh, fellow combatants in the South. The end of this struggle comes with a decision by the U.S. to pursue a policy of Vietnamization. In other words, to withdraw American forces and turn the struggle over to the South Vietnamese government. The Americans are well aware that in the end this will probably lead to the defeat of the South, but they hope to create a decent interval between the end of American involvement and the final collapse of the regime in the South. The most striking number in this process is the figure here when you see that U.S. troop levels had reached 450,000 in 1969. By 1972, they're down to 42,000. 90% of U.S. troops in Vietnam were withdrawn uh, between 1969 and 1972, a vast reduction uh, in the commitment of U.S. armed forces uh, to the struggle in Vietnam. And in their place, um, a massive increase in supplies to the South Vietnamese in terms of weapons, air power, training, uh, in the hopes that the South will survive at least for some decent interval.
Meanwhile, throughout the period of uh, Vietnamization, as the U.S. is withdrawing its forces, it's also secretly negotiating with the communists in Paris uh, to come to a final agreement. These talks drag on seemingly interminably for four years, actually, uh, because of the U.S. insistence that the communists withdraw all of their forces from the South as a part of any agreement, something, of course, the communists were never going to do because they were already heavily entrenched in the South. Finally, in 1973, an armistice is reached. Communists are allowed to stay in place. The final American forces withdraw, except for token forces with the U.S. Embassy. And a decent interval, if you will, does occur until a new communist offensive in 1975 leads to the final collapse of the government in the South. And with its collapse, the reunification of North and South Vietnam. These two struggles, that against the French in the 1950s and against the South Vietnamese government and the Americans in the 1960s and 70s, uh, are closely related, as I've suggested. They have roots in the same fundamental realities. The long history of Vietnam's struggle to throw off foreign control and domination, reaching an accelerated state under French colonialism. The impact of French colonialism itself, stripping peasants, particularly in the South, of their lands and creating a frustrated middle class. These factors, which help bring the communists to the fore in the fight against the Japanese and then against the French themselves in the 1940s and 50s, were essentially the same forces that were at work in the South in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, because the South Vietnamese government failed uh, to address the basic needs of the peasantry for land and failed to create an inclusive government in which the middle class felt that they had a role to play in shaping their destiny. Those realities allowed the communists to build a base of support and eventually topple this regime, assisted, of course, by the ever-growing American support, which on the one hand made it possible for the South Vietnamese government to survive longer, but on the other hand branded it as simply a colonial lackey. Uh, nothing was more apt in terms of the ability of the communists to describe the South Vietnamese as the lackeys of colonialism than their constant search for support from the United States. The more Americans that appeared in the South, the more the Vietnamese people could become convinced that indeed uh, their government in the South was nothing more than an extension of U.S. power into Southeast Asia. Looking at all of this and trying to summarize it, okay, one of the issues here is to characterize the Vietnamese Revolution. Is it a nationalist revolution or a communist revolution? It's both, but it's fundamentally a nationalist revolution. Ho Chi Minh, who died before the final triumph of the communists in the South, uh, was the ultimate pragmatist. Uh, when choices were to be made between uh, radical change and nationalism, nationalism came first. Should the communists fight alone? No. We need to ally ourselves with other groups, more moderate groups, because the defeat of the French and later the defeat of the Americans is more important. That led to the creation of the Viet Minh, uh, creation of the National Liberation Front. So as much as Ho Chi Minh was a communist, as much as uh, a communist society would be created in the North and later in the South uh, with massive land reform and state control of the economy, the first priority throughout this revolution was the independence of Vietnam, first from French rule and then from uh, influence and domination by the United States in the South. The groups, so when we're looking for what are the goals of the revolution, First and foremost, national independence. But in addition to that, we do have other issues. The two main actors in this drama are the landless peasantry and the disaffected middle class. Both of these groups certainly shared a common support for Vietnamese nationalism, for Vietnamese independence. But they also shared a common concern for social and economic justice, 
peasants, that meant land reform. For the middle class, it meant greater opportunities for their children and the right to direct their own destinies in managing their own government. So we get a merger of goals between these groups that lead to a revolution focused on anti-colonialism and the creation of a socialist society. Finally, in Vietnam today, we see, much as in China, a turning away from the most rigid aspects of communist society and communist economic policy, and opening up to the West, a more pragmatic approach, something approximating state capitalism. That is not terribly surprising in Vietnam, given the long history of pragmatism by communist leaders, and especially Ho Chi Minh, down through these years of struggle. So when we look at the Vietnamese Revolution and try to sum it up, we see here society with a long tradition of fighting for its independence. A society which, because of French rule, saw that goal as ever more important. And because French rule dramatically altered Vietnamese society in terms of the peasantry and the status of the middle class, this added a new purpose to the revolutionary struggle. And ultimately, the goals of the revolution were quite simple, whether fought in the north or the south. Throw off foreign domination and create a more equitable society with land for peasants and a society of opportunities for the Vietnamese middle class. This was the essence of the Vietnamese revolution as the struggle was fought out from the mid-1940s all the way to the mid-1970s.